Welcome uh, to this Yonkers Public Library uh, program. We're very excited and very happy to have with us tonight Grady Hendricks and Chris Pajali, who are authors of the new book, These Fists Break Bricks, How Kung Fu Movies Swept America and Changed the World. Um, so if you're not familiar with this book, and if you uh, haven't seen a Kung Fu movie or martial arts movie at all, uh, I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs um, about the book, give you a sense of what it's like. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Chris and Grady and what they've done. And then we're going to go into um, uh, Q&A about the book. Well, I'll ask some questions about the book. And then after I'm uh, done, uh, after we're all done, uh, I'm going to take questions from our Zoom attendees. Okay, so that's going to be uh, the structure um, of the evening. So this is from uh, the publisher of the book is Mondo. And this is from the Mondo website description of the book. When a Hollywood studio released Five Fingers of Death to thrill-seeking Times Square moviegoers in 1973, only a handful of Black and Asian audience members knew the difference between an iron fist and an eagle's claw. That changed overnight as Five Fingers of Death kicked off a kung fu craze that would earn millions at the box office, send TV ratings soaring, influence the birth of hip hop, reshape the style of action we see in movies today, and introduce America to some of the biggest non-white stars to ever hit motion picture screens. This lavishly illustrated book tells the story of how these high kicking, brick breaking movies came to America and raised hell until greed, infomercials and racist fear mongering shut them down. It's about CIA agents secretly funding karate movies. The New York Times fabricating a fear campaign about black karate gangs out to kill white people. The history of black martial arts in America, the death of Bruce Lee and the onslaught of imitators that followed. Here for the first time is the full uncensored story. And again, with us tonight are the authors of the book, Grady Hendricks and Chris Pajali. Grady Hendricks is the author of Horror Store, uh, which he has described as the only novel about a haunted Scandinavian furniture store you'll ever need. He is also the author of My Best Friend's Exorcism, which he has described as Beaches Meets the Exorcist, and Paperbacks from Hell, which is the nonfiction uh, history of the horror paperback boom in the 70s and 80s, which won the Bram Stoker Award. His next novel was We Sold Our Souls, a heavy metal take on the Faust legend. And uh, he is the author of two New York Times bestsellers, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which was published in 2020. And I could say it was very popular with our patrons at the Yonkers Public Library. And most recently, The Final Girl Support Group, published in 2021. He is one of the founders of the New York Asian Film Festival, and he was a film critic for the New York Sun, and he has written for Playboy, Slate, The Village Voice, The New York Post, Film Comment, and Variety. Welcome, Grady. The co-author is uh, Chris Pajali, who is a librarian, film historian, and Rondo-nominated writer who edited the fanzine Temple of Schlock from 1987 to 1991, and Chris brought it back as a blog in 2008. He has written for Turner Classic Movies, Cinema Retro, Fangoria, Rue Morgue, Shock Cinema, and Film Facts. And his essays, commentaries, and other special features have appeared on DVD Blu-ray releases from the Criterion Collection, Kino Lorber, Shout Factory, Arrow Films, and Synapse Films. And I should probably also mention that uh, I'm Phil Pajali, I'm a librarian, at the Yonkers Public Library. And uh, Chris Pajali is my brother. And uh, I'm really uh, excited about this book. Obviously, I have a copy of it. Um, you know, Chris and I have been martial arts movies fans since we were kids. Um, I was certainly aware that he had this amazing uh, poster collection, uh, but I didn't know all of these stories. 
and uh, it's a thrill reading this book. Um, Chris is a librarian at the New Rochelle Public Library, and I remember um, when you know I was a kid. Uh, he was, you know, he was a preteen taking the bus into downtown Syracuse to the local library uh, to use the microfilm and to do research to find uh, movie ads, go through old newspapers and find the ads, copy down information on index cards about, you know, any movie he was interested in. So it makes uh, perfect sense to me that he ended up being a librarian and writing about film. Uh, I think this is an amazing book. I think uh, I'm very proud of Chris, and I think uh, Grady and Chris have done an amazing job with this. Um, so with all that being said now, um, I'd like to uh, ask our authors some questions. First, um, these fist break bricks has been in development for a few years. Uh, how did the project get started? Uh, first of all, it was, it was really nice to not, not have to worry about having uh, my name mispronounced. OG Allen. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, I, you, what was your question? How did it get started? Uh, yes. I, I did, uh, uh, well, uh, as you said, I, I've been interested in martial arts movies for a long time and uh, had been doing research for a long time and collecting movie posters for a long time. And uh, there, there are several start and stops to this story. So I'll, I'll uh, keep it short. But uh, uh, at, at one point around 2016, I think uh, this book came out called uh, Grindhouse, the uh, cross, uh, Grindhouse Cross-Cultural Exchange on 42nd Street, which is a really interesting book, except it didn't uh, it didn't have a chapter that I really thought it should have uh, about martial arts movies. And I was aware of it when it was being written. Uh, and so I was looking forward to it coming out and uh, I flipped through it and I said, uh, th there's nothing in here on martial arts movies, which I think is the ultimate genre really for cross-cultural exchange, certainly on 42nd Street. Uh, and to, to not have that, I, I, I realized, you know, if, uh, if they don't, if they didn't do it, uh, I don't think anybody's really going to tell the story. And uh, so that's, that was really the first real kick in the behind for me to, to start seriously thinking about it. And then uh, Phil, when we went out to see Angela Mao, the martial artist uh, who has, a, a, you know, several restaurants in Queens, in 2018, I wanted to bring some posters uh, with us to get signed. And it took me like over an hour to go through my posters to try to find two of them to bring. And I said, yeah. I have like over 400 of these posters that are just for martial arts movies. Hmm. And it, it would be a shame to, to not you know, do anything with them. Uh, and and that, that was really, uh, really the, the, final, the final kick in the pants to, uh, to get this started. And um, a couple months after that, I talked to Grady about it. Uh, and I said, you know, is, is there an idea here? I think, I think this, this would be a, a really good book. Uh, but, you know, we, we talked about it and our feeling was that you, you could go in one direction, it would just be posters and ads and captions, or it would be no posters, no graphics at all. And it would be like Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, or Can't Stop, Won't Stop. It would be like the, the epic story of, of martial arts and martial arts movies in the United States. So we, we decided to kind of meet in the middle with this and do like a coffee table book and also a history book and, uh, and, and working on it together to try to find the story and the best way to tell this story. Yeah, and I had actually, um, in 2016, seven, I don't know, at some point, um, I, I got involved with this documentary that wound up going to Netflix called Iron Fist and Kung Fu Kicks about Hong Kong action movies. And I had a real bee in my bonnet that um, these movies, a lot of people talk about how they're made, you know, what action choreographer and this and that and all that stuff. But no one ever talks about why they were popular. And part of that's the story, right? It's it's mm -hmm. these movies about kids who have nothing, 
they, they came out of Hong Kong starting in 1967 about, you know, out of these anti-colonial riots, but about kids who have nothing standing up to the man, the system, corrupt politicians, corrupt officials, and sort of taking them down, often dying in the process with like 17 axes in their stomachs. And <laughs> I really feel like, you know, those movies tapped into an audience that wanted to see that. They wanted to see in America, non-white young people standing up to the system. And there was a huge audience for that that was really underserved. And that documentary was great. Um, uh, it took a while for it to actually get made because Brett Ratner was the original producer and he, he became a very not wanting to stand next to him individual. So we had to get rid of Brett Ratner and do all this stuff and it wound up on Netflix. And, um, and the problem is we did all these interviews and all this research and all this stuff and then it's a, 58 minute documentary. Um, and so I sort of had felt like, you know, it was like coitus interruptus or documentary us interrupt us. Um, and so I still had this like desire to do more. And then Chris came in with this idea. And one of the really nice things about working together is that Chris is the researcher that I am not. Um, but we both share a belief that saying things like, martial arts movie, a wave of martial arts movies hit America in 1973 is really a hand wave. It's a garbage thing to say. There had to be a first one. There had to be a second one. They had to start somewhere. Everything starts somewhere. Things don't just happen in the zeitgeist. That, that's impossible. And so, um, so and, and with Chris, and, and usually I'm lazy, so I quit before I nail it down, but Chris is really good at this stuff. And so between us, we were sort of like one functional writer. Yeah, I was going to ask how how you worked as uh, you know, as co-authors and how you kind of split up the work. Uh, we sort I, of went where our enthusiasms went to some extent. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At at the start, yeah, definitely. And uh, there was a back and forth because I I can sometimes uh, often be like an information dump. I, I'll just pile all the information on and then I would send it to Grady and <laughs> Grady would be like, okay, this is too inside Kung Fu, I guess. Uh, this is, okay, this can be funny. This, this, you know, and, and so he would find you know, a, a way to make it funny or uh, a little more interesting, less of an information dump, send it back to me. And then, you know, then he would send me uh, things and I would go through and dump information onto what he had written and then he would have to rewrite it. <laughs> so, but we, we went back and forth like that uh, yeah. on a lot of it. Yeah. And one of the saddest things about this book, because I, I look at it and I see all the stuff we had to cut because there's so much good stuff that we had to cut out. Um, so much stuff about the comic books uh, that had to go. So much stuff about the comic book ads that a guy named Dan Kelly out of Chicago did for us that was like such a deep dive. Um, Chris did so much about the music and actually we, we lost an entire section on Kung Fu action paperbacks, men's adventure paperbacks that Chris worked really hard on that was really sad. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was a lot of cutting that was depressing. Yeah. A lot on the, uh, television, uh, I yeah, mean, tons. some of that still ended up there, but there was, uh, there was more on like the Western shows and, and how uh, martial arts entered into the Western shows and, uh, and really how Westerns, you know, you, people like to say that in the early seventies, the Kung Fu movies really kind of kicked the Western out, but the, the Western really, I mean, that, that became, I mean, that's what Kung Fu was. It was a Western TV show. And yeah, yeah. So right at the tail end of it, but I mean, westerns did everything first and then just retired. <laughs> it's, it's the way I look at it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember when you were telling me about the research you were doing on the Wild Wild West, which had, I guess, martial arts in it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The uh, the first season there was a first season episode that has the the first uh, the first use of kung fu on a network television show. Oh. And yeah, and there's also there's another first season episode where there are there are shots in the final fight that were copied for um, Fist of Fury. 
like the the Bruce dojo Lee. scene when when Bruce Lee goes with the the sign and and then beats everybody up in the in the dojo. Oh, yeah. There are yeah. shots, yeah, and it, like we looked into it in um, the South China Morning Post. The Wild Wild West was on in Hong Kong until 1972. It, it was on TV, so you know there's there's yeah. no way Lo, 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 didn't see it. <laughs> Lo Wei, who directed Lo Wei. that movie, is uh, would not be above stealing some shots he liked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Grady, uh, one of the more extraordinary stories in the book uh, focuses on LA policeman Jack Sergel and judo teacher Sego Murakami, a friendship affected by the rise of the Japanese internment camps. Uh, could you talk a little about what happened with Sergel and Murakami? Yeah. So Chris had this blurb, this like police blotter blurb about uh, a judo fight between two dudes on Jimmy Cagney's front lawn around, God, Chris, what was it, 1955, 50? Yeah, it was like mid mid to late 50s. Yeah. Mid 50s, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and so when we did this book, we, we knew everything kicks off in March of 73 with uh, Five Fingers of Death coming to American theaters in a dubbed version. But we wanted to know what was there before because nothing comes from nowhere. And so one of the, this clip was sort of a, a key to that because we started looking into it and man, we went down such a rabbit hole. We were finding letters that Jack Sergal had written to Black Belt Magazine. We were finding articles. We found um, uh, uh, scrapbooks that his old students had. Um, we wound up talking to Sego Murakami's grand, great, or no, grandchildren. And the basic story that came out and I'll give you the short version, was that judo was huge before karate, before kung fu. That was sort of the order they came in, judo or jujitsu, karate, which came back with the servicemen in World War II largely. And then um, kung fu sort of came later and, and smaller. Um, judo was so big, Madam Curry was teaching, you know, she was teaching judo uh, to make ends meet. Teddy Roosevelt took judo. Like judo was this huge, the teamsters, cops everywhere, judo was hot. And this guy, uh, Jack Sergal, who was an LAPD officer, he'd actually been a mortician, but he uh, had an allergy to um, formaldehyde or, or the embalming fluid they used that made his hands flake. So he became a cop and he really loved to beat people up. By his own admission, he was basically, I don't know if people remember the Russell Crowe character in LA Confidential, oh, yeah. but that was Jack Sergal. Um, he was a violent guy who thought he was pretty much human i mean he describes himself as being like without redeeming qualities um and he heard that there was this japanese dude teaching uh judo which was a new way to kick ass and he barged and insisted that that murakami teach him judo and murakami ran a flower nursery in the san fernando valley and had a dojo and Murakami was like, fuck off, dude. I, I want nothing to do with you. Uh, and, and Sergal kept coming back. And finally, Murakami taught him. And according to Sergal, really saved his life. I mean, it was a really whole life change for him. He became a calmer person, a nicer person. He wound up co-teaching. He got his black belt, blah, blah, blah. And ultimately, all that came to an end. All of it with the internment act uh, when World War II broke out, where we put every Japanese person in the country in a concentration camp. And one of the things that I don't think really gets remembered is every Japanese person born here, immigrant, whatever you were, you went to a camp and you had to sell all your property and you were only allowed to carry, take what you could carry. That was it. Uh, Murakami had to put his nursery up for sale at like fire sale prices to a dude who put up a big sign in the front yard that said, now owned by white Americans. Um, people sold their cars for five, 10, $15. I mean, they lost everything. And, uh, and, and Murakami asked Sergal to take over his dojo and also hide a lot of heirlooms from families. They couldn't, you know, family photos, things they couldn't take with them, ashes of, of their you know, of family members. Um, they couldn't take with them to the camps. So Sergal, these guys all go to the camps and Sergal's got this problem, which is that you can't move to the next belt level unless someone of a certain belt level reviews you. And the only people who can do that are in the camps. Okay. So he gets all his students to start pooling their gas ration and they go off to the camp and do these two day training things with Murakami giving people their belts and everything. He, they come back after doing a few of these that the press wants to talk to him and Circle's like, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a great thing we're doing, blah, blah, blah. 
instantly headlines, you know, Jap prisoners, Pauline white American women, worshiping, forcing them to worship pictures of the emperor, whole scandal, tempest in a teapot, Sergal winds up having to resign from the LAPD. He goes on to become Jimmy Cagney's judo coach um, because Cagney loved judo. Uh, and in fact, in an earlier movie, G-Men, you can see him getting sort of thrown around with uh, judo at one point. So Sergal and Cagney make this movie together in 1945 and he changes it, change, Chris, he changes the name to Jack Halloran, right? For the movies? Um, no, it was John, it was John um, I think it was John Halloran. John Halloran, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, so Sergal changes his name for the movies. He's now out of the LAPD, had this whole scandal. And he plays a Japanese dude in yellow face, the bad guy in this movie, Blood on the Sun, 1945 with Cagney, which is actually not a bad movie, but it also features this giant, like endless, like you think the wrestling match between Rowdy, you know, with Rowdy Roddy Piper and They Live goes on forever. This judo fight, man, is like <laughs> twice as long. Um, and it's probably the first real martial arts battle in American cinema. Um, and um, so, you know, and, 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 and Sergal goes on to have a career as a character actor and all this. And the wild thing was, he actually also, um, so when the war ended, everyone slid out of the internment camps basically with nothing to start over from scratch. And Ken Kuniyuki, who had been Jimmy Cagney's former judo coach, he goes back, picks up at his dojo and he and Sergal are friends, Murakami, they're all friends, they're judging judo competitions together. And at some point, um, Kuni Kuniyuki, was was married to um, Jimmy Cagney, the woman who's his cook and, and, and maid. And he comes by the house. He gets in a fight with his former wife. Sergal intervenes. He and Kuniyuki get in a fight in Cagney's front yard. The cops come, they arrest Kuniyuki. And it's like these guys went from being best friends, from storing each other's heirlooms, taking over each other's jo do dojos, to having a fist fight, like a judo fight in Cagney's front yard. Um, and it just shows you how much the war just poisoned everything. And judo really never recovered. It became, you know, it was an Olympic sport. It did all this stuff, but it never, it never got back to the prominence it had before then. Um, it was a real parting of the way. So I said that was the short version. It's a long <laughs> version. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's fascinating. Um, Chris, another surprising story in the book is the formation of Junri's Taekwondo club okay, yeah. for u.s congressman mm -hmm. uh why was that established uh well it's fine but before we started recording we were talking about that about uh there, there was a uh there was a congressman uh from new hampshire who who was mugged a couple of times in washington and june re uh, read about this uh and uh, june re was a korean martial artist who came to the u.s in the 50s and uh, had gotten a, I think a civil engineer degree at the University of Texas. And while he was there, uh, he was teaching Tang Soo Do, uh, which, which he called Korean karate. And he established the, um, I guess the, the, Tex the University of Texas Karate Club, I think it's called, um, while he was there. And he, uh, after graduation, he moved to Washington and uh, around that time, I'm not going to get into too much of this, but it's really interesting if you read up on Taekwondo uh, and how that came about, like the history of Taekwondo. At some point in the early 60s, uh, Tang Soo Do kind of got folded into Taekwondo. And uh, so Jun Ri had this, uh, was now teaching Taekwondo. And uh, he, he started uh this he, he opened up a school in washington and he read about uh this this uh congressman uh who had been mugged and he just decided to uh to offer him free taekwondo lessons and then uh he was already june Ri was also was already teaching uh like the wives of um uh, uh pentagon uh, employees and and mm -hmm. like the sons of army personnel uh, and and other other uh, Washington uh, people, you know, employees uh, in the government, and so he he started this this congressional Taekwondo club, uh, where he gave free lessons, and he did it for 
like 40 years or you know, close to 40 years. He was, uh, he was teaching, you know, everybody from Newt Gingrich to Joe Biden uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people in between Jack Valenti of the Motion Picture Association of America, who had been a speechwriter for a couple of presidents and had, you know, worked under, um, I think, Nixon and, and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he, he was one of the students. Uh, and, and, you know, whenever like attendance would drop, uh, they would send out letters to, uh, I, th I think that the founder, I mean, uh, June Ree was the instructor, but the, the founder of this club was a senator named Milton Young of North Dakota. And he was like 77 uh, at the time. Well, you know, he was, he started it with June Ree in like 1965 or so. And then uh, in the mid seventies, he was up for his, his last, uh, his last reelection. And he, he got reelected by a very narrow margin. It was like 165 votes or something like that. Uh, his opponent in the, um, Republican primaries was making a big deal out of his age. They, oh, you know, he's 77 years old. You know, he's, you know, it's time to step out and everything. So, uh, you know, whatever it was like 10 years of, or five years of taekwondo lessons he started chopping boards <laughs> and 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 i he had it filmed and he worked it into his his uh campaign and yeah he ended up winning by like 165 votes it was one of the longest uh one of the longest senators i think uh longest running um grady one of the things that i picked up from the book is the idea of hing dai um a fraternal blood bond that runs through a lot of uh, Chinese martial arts cinema, and he carries over to John Woo's contemporary action films. Uh, what is Hing Dai, and how would you define it, and why is it important to this genre? Yeah, so Hing Dai is really interesting because it comes out of um, the late 60s when there was this whole, like all these anti-colonial riots and this whole revolution in filmmaking because for that action movies, um, they were very delicate, sedate affairs often. And, and then with Chang Che and One-Armed Swordsman with Jenny Wong Yu in 1967, suddenly they're like blood and guts and arms getting chopped off and all this. But the thing that was really revolutionary was this concept of Hing Dai, this, this bond with your brother. And in Confucianism, it sort of goes, there's, there's the heavens, the emperor, you know, whatever official is in your province or, you know, whatever, uh, your parents, you. It's a very vertical relationship. And those are the people you owe things to and the people who are over you. And Hing Dai wasn't this vertical kind of thing, um, this vertical relationship, it was horizontal. It was this bond with your brothers. It was, it was this blood bond with your brothers. You would, it wasn't about dying for the emperor or dying for your father or your family. It was dying for your brother. It was dying for your equal. It was, it was a bond of choice, not by birth, not by government affiliation or, or, or the universe is decreed in this way. And it was this revolutionary idea. And, and, and one of the biggest things you can see with it is the movies with Thi Lung and David Chang, who were after Jimmy Wong Yu sort of said, screw you to Shaw Brothers and, and got in this big lawsuit with them because they couldn't tell him what to do. And he wasn't allowed to make movies in Hong Kong for several years. Chang Che, the director, needed new acolytes and he got Thi Lung and David Chang because he needed two guys to replace one Jimmy Wong Yu because he was such a badass. <laughs> and um, David Chang and Thi Lung were basically like cinema's hottest couple. They were these dudes who would, you know, often they would start out as enemies, but then they would become blood brothers and they would often die in each other's arms holding, I mean, they really, yeah. there's, and people say there's sort of this homoerotic undercurrent to it. That's a very Western notion. Um, Chinese culture is much more comfortable with, with same sex uh, physical contact. And there's a real affection to this bond of Hang Dai. It's really, this person is closer than your parents. Um, and, and, you know, you will die for them. And you see it, um, it really, you know, movies in Hong Kong, action movies were really getting very dark and sort of cynical in the 80s, uh, especially modern action movies. There were a lot of like, you know, immigrants coming to Hong Kong to rob banks and then they all die like dogs and all this. I mean, it was great stuff, but very dark. And then John Woo made A Better Tomorrow, 
which is all about Hing Dai. It's all these guys. It's it's Di Lung again. It's Chow Yun Fat instead of David Chang, and you know the little brother Leslie Jung, and they're dying for each other, bleeding in each other's arms. You know, um, it, it covered in one another's bodily fluids, um, and and that became this real thing. And I mean, people called it the heroic blood bloodshed um, genre. But mm -hmm. this concept of Hing Dai was just huge and, and really revolutionary. Um, and you know, it's it's solidarity with your brother, the brother that you choose, not the one you're born with. So you know, you two don't necessarily have it. <laughs> I, I don't buy it until one of you dies and the other one dies to the other one. <laughs> um, why were martial arts movies so popular with minorities in the U.S., particularly African Americans and Latinos? Well, I will say the short answer, because Chris probably has a better answer, is that because they didn't star white people. <laughs> there were lots of them and they had big budgets and it wasn't full of white people. Uh, well, the the, uh, the movies really started uh, to attract uh, minority audiences, I think in the 60s, and it kind of it paralleled the civil rights movement and with uh, the interest in you know learning martial arts uh so you wouldn't get in trouble carrying a gun and uh and also it's you know it, it's a, a way of you know bettering bettering yourself and and uh and it's uh you know just just taking on i mean the, what 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 i imagine the black panthers you know th in in studying martial arts uh a lot of it is similar to those congressmen um you know the the people in congress who who took it it's it's just uh you know it's discipline it teaches you uh you know you pick up a, a lot of a lot of good habits and it, you know it teaches you discipline and and uh it's health you know it's 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 good for your health it's exercise and and also it's you know, it's self-defense and yeah you you need it you know uh african americans and and hispanics would need that as much as the congressmen especially you know back especially back congressmen who get mugged twice <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. or shot yeah i mean there there was one in the 70s um there was a, a congressman i think in the early 70s who was shot in his front yard and uh and then the uh you know getting back to the congressional karate club the enrollment went up again they got like 20 people overnight who who uh signed up you know representatives and senators who signed up for that but uh yeah i i think uh the interest in martial arts in um you know the african-american community uh a lot of the students were going to chinatown and seeing the movies there in the late 60s like when um one armed swordsman with jimmy wang yu when that showed up um there were a, a lot of I forgot what the what the percentage was, but we found an article from one of the Chinatown theaters in New York where uh, the the manager was saying I, don't know, I think it was twenty percent twenty percent of the people coming in were African American. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also one of the things also is that you know the Nation of Islam, which was huge in the Black community all through the 20th century up until it kind of fell apart some in the in the late 70s i think i don't have the exact date uh and before it revived in the late 80s but uh their security arm the fruit of islam didn't carry guns in part because they didn't want to get jacked up on gun charges mm -hmm. and so they learned martial arts they learned judo and karate um to to provide security mm. and there were the bodyguards yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Were like bodyguards for malcolm x and <clears throat> and yeah and and you had um you know celebrities like uh, kareem abdul jabbar you know, in interviews yeah. would talk about going to the toho la brea theater to watch zatoichi movies and and uh uh you know the the japanese films that were showing there the you know sword of doom or yeah. three outlaw samurai uh but he was a big i know he, he mentioned zatoichi a bunch of times and and then you know he started studying with bruce lee uh, so you had a lot of uh, a lot of the celebrities uh, who were 
going to see those movies and and not just uh, not just minorities. Uh, uh, I know Robert Conrad, who was studying a Hawaiian form, getting back to Wild Wild West. Uh, Robert Conrad studied a Hawaiian form, uh, Kaju Kenbo, and, but he was always at the theaters in L.A. watching the you know, the, the Japanese movies, as well as the, you know, later when the Hong Kong movies started playing. Yeah. yeah. And also just to throw something out there, um, you know, black exploitation movies, which, which also were aimed at, at the urban audience, um, but they came with a lot of complications, especially in the urban community where people really did say, you know, is this what we want to be showing? Like the heroes of these movies are, are drug dealers or pimps or, I mean, not all of them, Very many high. of them. Yeah. yeah, and and so these the the martial arts movies didn't have that baggage with them, and one of the other things, and this was something that was so that we tried to get across in the book, but it is really really hard. Having been embryonic in the early seventies, it is very hard for me to wrap my head around how much how sucky your life was if you weren't white in America. Um, you know. The South Bronx, which was largely a, a Latin and Black neighborhood, 20% of the people living in the South Bronx in the early 70s got their drinking water from fire hydrants. That is insane. Um, you had people calling for, for Black majority neighborhoods to be raised to the ground. And you had Richard Nixon running for re-election 72, right, Chris? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, running for re-election re 72. And to prime the pump, he flooded communities, especially poor communities, which were often communities of color with money, funding all these projects, water projects, water improvement, projects, sewage improvement, school education for public schools, all these projects so that he could get poor people voting for him, parks, all these things. And, and I am not kidding, the second he got elected, he just turned off the pump, he canceled every single, all these projects, the appropriations had already gone in, the bills had been passed. And Nixon just yanked the money. Um, and so you had all these places like the South Bronx or you know, the combat zone in, in, in Boston, all these neighborhoods, Watts in LA, that have been promised all these things. You are gonna get a park. We're gonna refurbish your school. We're gonna do these things that need to be done. Nah, not anymore. So this was an audience that was really ready to see a movie where, you know, um, Chin Quan Tai ripped the eyeballs out of like <laughs> some rich fat cat. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, I, I wanted to mention also that Chris brought up Zatoichi. Um, this has Kung Fu in the title, this book, but you also cover the Japanese mm -hmm. samurai films. You cover the Japanese Sonny Chiba films. Uh, you look at ninja films. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, it branches off a little bit. So it, it, it kind of, it has a very wide umbrella, the book. Well, yeah. you got to talk about ninjas. Well, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna say, uh, you know, in the in the mid '80s, uh, after the first two American Ninja movies were done, um, were were shot and released, uh, Michael Dudikoff, who was the star of the two movies, kind of stepped down, and instead of making his co-star Steve James the star of the the third one, they just went and got David Bradley and plugged him in and kept Steve James as the sidekick. And, uh, you know, the, the first American ninja was African-American, was Ronald Duncan. Yeah. Uh, it, going back to the mid sixties. I mean, he, he was, he was really the first person in the U S the, fir the first American born uh, US, or American citizen, yeah. American citizen anyway. Yeah. Who was, um, who was teaching ninjutsu. And and doing demonstrations, all the weaponry he would he would do um, all the time. He would travel to different um, uh, exhibitions and and you know to do uh, demonstrations of ninjutsu weaponry and and uh, yeah uh, and so it, it it it's it does a, a disservice I think to uh, to African Americans in in the world of martial arts and and also in entertainment to have uh, to not given Steve James and a disservice to Steve James, who was yeah, a who's great amazing. talent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And also just one other thing to say is one of the big conflicts and we hit it a little in the book, but it's hard to really get a lot of fact. You can get a lot of opinions on it and we just didn't have the time to get 
as many opinions as we needed. Mm -hmm. But there was a huge, just like in hip hop, there was a huge East Coast, West Coast beef in martial arts uh, because the magazines like Black Belt Magazine and Inside Kung Fu, all that stuff, they were based on the West Coast. And the, 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 so, and, and it was almost like two different worlds. Um, and I'm gonna step in it a little bit here because I'm gonna generalize, but to generalize, on the West Coast, you had a much more Hollywood friendly gang. You had the magazines getting published. You had, um, you had studios that were nicer and in better neighborhoods and, you know, and, and you had kind of a, a wider breed of, um, of, of karate and mar martial arts instructor. On the East Coast, you had a lot of dojos that were in tough neighborhoods. I mean, Dennis Brown, who we talked to in DC, talks about coming in, finding a dead body behind his dojo one day in the alley. Um, you had people like Ron Van Cleef teaching in a secret dojo, which I swear sounds like made up BS, but is true, a secret dojo in the basement of the Empire State Building, where he did closed door classes where he could use profanity and do full contact. Um, so you had people teaching in the basements of supermarkets, you know, in their back rooms. And you had a lot more black and Latin martial artists like Victor Moore and, and uh, Ron Van Cleef and Charles Bonnet. And so you really, they, they, there was no love lost there. And when Chris is pointing out that Ronald Duncan was the first sort of black, the first ninja, American ninja in real life, he was East Coast and a black man uh, teaching in the Bronx or Brooklyn, Chris, do you remember? It was in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah, um, and and so he was on ABC Wild World of Sports catching arrows and stuff. He was known, but he got in an argument with the editor of Black Belt Magazine and and people, his students, and and he himself say that was it. And you know, a year or so later, suddenly a white guy's on the cover of Black Belt Magazine, Steve Hayes, as the first American ninja teacher. And coincidentally, the same publisher that's owned by Black Belt Magazine is putting out Steve Hayes ninja books um, and all this stuff. Now, you know, I we didn't really go too deep into this because we right. wanted to keep this more about the movies and less about the world of martial arts, but yeah, it's not a good look. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you look at all the all the coverage that Ronald Duncan got in magazines. It was official karate and it was they were all East Coast magazines. Yeah, like official karate was published by Charlton, which was based in Connecticut. They, they also did Charlton comics. Uh, and yeah, it, you, you would never see Ronald Duncan covered in a West Coast magazine. It was, it was Stephen Hayes that he was, yeah. he was the, the West Coast ninja, <laughs> American ninja. Yeah. Uh, going back to Bruce Lee, how would you explain the appeal of, of Bruce Lee? And what is the movie that you think best captures his power both as a martial artist as and as an actor um i I'd, I'd say go with uh enter the dragon and then yeah. like work backwards yeah yeah i'm not a huge bruce lee fan but there is no denying he was one of a kind the guy has charisma to burn um and he was really, really smart. And just one of the things that always impresses me about Bruce Lee is he shouldn't have been a star. When he, he failed, he was basically, before he was in those movies, he was a B-list television kind of nobody, a, a grasping social climbing kung fu coach to some celebrities um, and, and doing mall appearances and convention appearances. He had a crippling back injury that, you know, he basically should have ended his career and was 30 something years old before he basically was like, I got to pay the mortgage and took a really cheap contract to basically, from his point of view, fail and go back home to Hong Kong, or go back to the city he grew up in Hong Kong. He was American. Um, to be in some really low budget movies. And it's only because he was pretty much a genius that he was able to turn those movies, which were not supposed to, he wasn't even supposed to be the star of the big boss um, and became the star through sort of sheer force of will and became this huge phenomenon, only made like four films. Um, and if you wanna see sort of Bruce Lee at his best, um, do, do this. Watch Game of Death, which is a terrible movie. Um, it's basically Golden Harvest's home studio's Bruce Ploitation movie. Bruce had shot about 40 minutes or so of footage for this thing, mostly from the end. 
They use 20 minutes. They use it in person. It is awful. I mean, and it's really even more awful because it's made by people who are his business partners. Um, but then you can find a thing called Game of Death Redux, which Alan Canvan, um, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but He's put together, it's on the Criterion box set. I think you can find it on YouTube where he's gone back and taken Bruce Lee's notes and the script and put together those like 35 minutes of footage basically the way Bruce wanted them. Mm -hmm. And it is a radically different movie. The action's better, there's comedy, the character bits work. It is funny, it flows better, it's astonishing. And that's all Bruce, you know? I mean, the guy really, if he'd had a full career, who the hell knows what he could have done? Uh, one one quick thing I want to throw in, um, it, without getting into what I think of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, I think the 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 few minutes that Bruce Lee is in Marlowe, I think he's he's great, and yeah. and I and I think that is what Quentin Tarantino was doing with his depiction of Bruce Lee. I think it was Bruce Lee as Winslow Wong from Marlowe. It, yeah. it, it somehow, it, because Marlowe was made in 19 or released in 1969, just the year that that movie set in, uh, it, it, it just seems like uh, the Marlowe, you know, his, his performance in Marlowe is kind of, I think it's in um, either. Uh, I think it's in the, either in the biography or maybe it's in some, a Sterling Silifan interview I read where uh, somebody was disappointed with his performance in Marlowe and felt like uh, it, it, but I, I think he's really good in that movie. And, yeah. and I, I think it's more influential uh, now uh, than, than it was certainly back then. Cause I, I don't think, I don't think it did much for him career wise. Yeah. And also, you know, just to say one last thing, but like, and I keep I'm not a Bruce Lee fan and I'm just <laughs> rambling about him forever, but you know, yeah, he was cocky. He had to be who, who, there was no roadmap for doing what he did. And he was the only person advocating for himself. He had a few other fans in, in the industry, but like he really, anything he got, he didn't get it by asking. He got it by taking and by going after it. So, you know, it's, it's, oh, he was, he bragged about himself and he was cocky. Well, yeah, he was a Chinese American guy trying to be in real life what he knew he was capable of being and that no one wanted to give him a chance to be. I mean, I'd be cocky too. I actually, I wouldn't be cocky. I'd go, oh, yeah, and go sit down and never be anything. <laughs> I'd probably I, write another dumb book. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, very quickly, uh, I, I wanted to mention The Way of the Dragon, which was first released here as Return of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I saw that on television as a kid, it was for me, it was it has a lot of humor in it. Uh, so and, you know, it it's has, very Hong Kong. Yeah, it is. And I, I know that he, yeah. I, he I know he directed it, but I think he, he also wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing it in its uh, seeing it in its native language, uh, I found it a strangely melancholy film. And I found the characters, uh, the supporting characters in particular, to seem very real. I was surprised. I really felt for this family that was trying to make this restaurant work in Rome with these Chinese immigrants who really feel out of place and the restaurant is failing and the father is, you know, desperate. Uh, I, it, it's strangely the movie, you know, it hit me hard, I think more than the other ones. So that, that might be my favorite Bruce Lee film. Well, yeah, and just to say something yeah. about that real quick is, you know, when Bruce got sent away by his family because he was getting into trouble and stuff in Hong Kong and, and they basically, you know, sent him to the States to straighten out, he got sent to a, a family friend or a family member's restaurant in Seattle where he was a busboy um, and lived by himself. He had no friends. He was in a country where he was a citizen, but he didn't have any, he hadn't lived here for very long ever, except as a baby. Um, his dad had basically kicked him out of home and not even come to see him off. Um, he had one friend show up to say goodbye to him. His mother had given him some money against his dad's wishes. I can't think of being lonelier or sadder or more lost. And I feel like Way of the Dragon definitely has some of that in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to, I'm just going to skip ahead uh, on the questions here. I'm, I'm 
wanted to um, have you talk a little bit about the ninja craze. Um, I'm old enough to vaguely remember when this was going on in the U.S. in the 1980s. Um, how and why did that happen, the ninja craze? Chris, man, <laughs> do some ninja. <laughs> uh, well, it, it really uh, it really kicked in in 1980 uh, with with Shogun, well, with the, the, the bestseller. There was a, a best-selling novel that was published in uh, 1980, I think in April, uh, by Eric Van Loosbader uh, called The Ninja. And that same year, like later in the year, there was the, uh, the Chuck Norris movie, The Octagon, came out in the summer and was uh, the, third, the third big Chuck Norris movie in a row, uh, box office-wise. And then... Uh, in the fall, there was Shogun, which has ninjas in it, and uh, the, the big miniseries, uh, Shogun, and, and then Shogun Assassin, so, uh, which had ninjas in it. And so it, 1980 was really the, the year when ninjas kind of uh, kicked in uh, in the public consciousness. But it, uh, they had been around for a while, you know, in, in the US anyway. Uh, uh, kind of bubbling beneath the the surface uh, especially in comic books uh, they had you know been in the iron fist and um even though there was an issue of the shadow comic book where the shadow fought a ninja uh and then on television like there was a hawaii 5 episode and a beretta episode which had ninjas and uh and the killer elite had had ninjas in it but uh it really uh exploded in 1980 and uh, and then you had Enter the Ninja come out the next year, uh, and it, it it was something that you know people could could go in Halloween. You know, it was an easy Halloween costume. You know, buy a ninja. You know, grab a ninja costume and go. And and unfortunately, people started robbing banks as ninjas and breaking into homes and and you know hold, holding hold, Penny Marshall hostage. <laughs> right. All right. <laughs> I forgot yeah. all about that story. Yeah, <laughs> right. These two teenagers dressed as ninjas broke into Penny Marshall's home, and uh, and then like midway through uh, the robbery, one of them recognized her. Hey, well, you're on you're on Laverne and Shirley, <laughs> and then ended up being arrested. Uh, but yeah, it was this this ninja crime wave for a few years there. You know, everything from you know, like I said, like armored car holdups or uh, you know, to uh, People, you know, teenagers running around ripping off candy on Halloween. You know, Charles in- Charles Ng, the serial killer who was caught in '85, right. his whole thing revolved around a fantasy that he was a ninja. Wow. Yeah. Think but- of how much different uh, Silence of the Lambs could have been. <laughs> well, there. Yeah. Isn't there that movie Fear City isn't the the killer in that. He's a martial, martial artist. artist. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the the Green Hornet project, uh, <laughs> which is a great story that comes up in the book. So basically, if you're not familiar with the TV show, the Green Hornet was on um, in like the mid 1960s. It lasted for one season. I think it was like 26 episodes. It was from the producer of the Batman TV show, William Dozier, and uh, it was like. Bruce Lee's first uh, big break. So um, when, you know, in the seventies after Bruce Lee became, well, after he had passed away and he became uh, and Enter the Dragon was a big hit and he was, he was suddenly hugely popular. There was a wave of what were called, uh, well, what is now called Bruce Bloitation movies um, that had uh, Bruce Lee imitators there's a whole section in the book about just Bruce exploitation, uh, but one of the one of the more interesting stories about that uh, is the the Green Hornet film, uh, which was the creation of uh, it was essentially. I think it's described in the book as one of the first fan edits uh, yeah. by um, uh, Larry and Marco Joachim. So I guess Chris, if you want to want to talk a little bit about that. Well, what what was really special about this case was that it was uh it actually had 
Bruce Lee in it, because uh, a lot of the the Bruce Blatation movies, even a like Game of Death, most of it is not Bruce Lee. They're different, you know, impersonators. Uh, but uh, Marco Joachim, who was 11 years old at the time, uh, his father Larry was kind of the king, the king of kitty matinees in New York. And what he would do is he would uh, rent out a print of a movie and show it in 30 or 40 theaters in the New York area on a weekend. And he liked holiday weekends. He especially liked Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, because, you know, he could get uh, three, three days in. Uh, and, and so, and, and also the kids, uh, the parents would drop the kids off for the matinees and then they would go shopping. Uh, so as long as the weather was uh, pretty terrible, uh, you know, if the weather was fine, he'd have a problem with, uh, you know, nobody would go to the movies, but if the, if the weather was bad, nobody wanted to be outside playing, they would go in to see a movie. So he had rented Batman and had done well with it. And Marco said, well, you know, there was another show from the same producer and, uh, you know, uh, and Bruce Lee was in it and Bruce Lee had just passed away. And Marco was a big Bruce Lee fan and, you know, big Kung Fu movie fan in general. So he talked his father into uh, getting a meeting at 20th Century Fox. Uh, Larry had been a stand-up comic and knew a lot of people in the industry. Uh, he, he knew, uh, he had known Ernie Kovacs and, and you know, a, a lot of other people. So he knew someone at Fox. And so he got a meeting and negotiated the theatrical rights to the Green Hornet. And everybody thought he was crazy because who's who who wants to pay to see a TV series that, that was that a flop? <laughs> yeah, right. it was it was a one season wonder, and <laughs> and it was seven years earlier at this point. And they're like theatrical rights, okay? You know how much how much are we going to get from this guy? You know this uh, you know East Coast crackpot. Uh, and yeah, so they they got like five thousand dollars from him for the theatrical rights. And then he ended up buying the world rights, the world theatrical rights to this. And Marco took the 16 millimeter prints of all the episodes, took notes and everything and and, uh, and edited together this feature film from uh, three, it was, it was a two part episode and then two other episodes. So it was really, it was four episodes. And, and then started throwing in fight scenes from other episodes and, uh, and just created his own, his own work of art. <laughs> uh, Very and, cohesive work of art. <laughs> right. Yeah. You have people like dropping in and out the characters who are, <laughs> you know, answering phones and, and talking about people who, you know, characters that are not in the rest of the film. Uh, and and we, he, he added one scene uh, just because he, he thought there wasn't enough, footage of bruce lee without his kato mask mm -hmm. and so he said oh there's this great scene i remember where he's on the phone uh with Britt reed and uh and and they're talking about someone and and you get a really good look at bruce lee without his mask so i'm going to cut that in there but it made no sense because they're talking about characters from another episode and yeah so he did things like that or uh, there's a scene where he knocks somebody out with, with like a karate chop and and uh like who was that who did he hit and, and yeah so it, it's it, it's a mess but it it came out and it was a, a huge hit and they they ended up doing a sequel uh and he edited the uh, the film on the equipment that his mom barbara loden had used to um to edit her film wanda, wanda. a couple of yeah. years earlier yeah yeah um I, I have one last question for you guys, and then we'll take questions from the Zoom attendees. Um, what is one thing that you had to uh, take out of the book that that you, uh, I don't know, you regret taking out or you feel sad about? Um, I, I feel I, I feel very conflicted over everything we took out of the book. Um, but one of the big things that I wish is we did a lot more on infomercials at the end that we wound up stripping down. Uh, and I wish we'd had more because, um, what's his name, Chris? Tiger Yang? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tiger Yang did a lot of infomercials. It would, it would have been more fun to keep them in there, but we didn't have a lot of art for infomercials. And by that point, you know, we were belaboring the point. Yeah, yeah, I, I would have to say that that was the segment also that because uh, there there was a, a lot of stuff that I wish we could have kept. 
but that's the first thing that came to mind was the Tiger Yang segment, all, not yeah. only because of the infomercials, which was really interesting. And also he, he made that, uh, that Ted V. Michaels movie that took like 10 years oh, yeah. to, <laughs> to finish. They started filming it in 1981 and they finished in 1990. Yeah. Uh, and like half the footage had, it was stolen. Like, you know, they had to reshoot the whole movie. So there, that, that segment of the Tiger Yang was cut. And also he was in, or he was supposed to be in a Cleopatra Jones sequel, the third Cleopatra Jones movie, which never got made. So we had information about that also. And the, the funny thing about that was that there was only one announcement in the trades about Cleopatra Jones and the Cambodian connection. Uh, there's one notice in Daily Variety in like January 1981, I think. And, and it says something like, Cleopatra Jones of the Cambodian Connection will, is, is ready to start filming featuring Vanna White. This, this, yeah. new, this new actress, oh, you know, this, this, this starlet on the rise, <laughs> Vanna White will be, will be in Cleopatra Jones of wow. the Cambodian Connection. And what, what <laughs> year was that? 1981. It was, it, was, uh, so, it was right after graduation day. I think yeah, right I after she shot saying, graduation yeah. day. Because a lot of the people who were involved with that, like Christopher George, was also supposed to be in Cleopatra Jones and the Cambodian oh, Connection. So okay. all this stuff that we had about Tiger Yang got, yeah. got cut. And also there's stuff, you know, we just missed, um, you know, that we hope other people will write their own books because we mm -hmm. missed a ton. Uh, we missed out on Whacking with, with two A's, which was like a <laughs> dance movement um that popped up on soul train from one of their few asian dancers which was like a martial arts inspired street kind of like disco b-boying combo that wound up popping up in movies and things so we missed a ton yeah it's a terrible book don't buy it <laughs> yeah all that like that uh all, all the uh, the ways that uh martial arts movies influenced you know r&b and and then hip hop and a lot of that we, we didn't get in there um yeah. you know and jimmy joe soul train jody watley was always like working kung fu moves into her dancing yeah. also you know even, even before the whacking thing all right so um who has questions you can either uh hopefully you'll have you know the ability to unmute yourself or <laughs> you can uh just type it in the chat and i'll read it questions questions Hello? Oh, yeah. Chris. Hi. Yeah. Yes, I'm Chris. I know Phil well. Uh, yes, I, I did listen to uh, some of the book on audiobook, and I, I want to save it for a really good road trip because I got those were available at the library. And I enjoyed reading about the early history of the martial arts. I didn't get that far yet into it. But, uh, but uh, my question was can you think of another martial arts movie or series of martial arts movies that would make a good follow up TV series with the same characters to this day? Be it YouTube, Netflix, or regular TV. Well, I mean, there, there's been um, there's been several attempts to do a Black Samurai TV series over the years, you know, based on the the novels, and then you know, because I think there were eight novels, and then there was a movie, uh, and I, I know uh, there was a, an attempt to do a TV series by Jerry Bruckheimer, starring Common, uh, a couple of years ago. The, uh, that would be interesting, uh, I think um to do something with that uh i you know but as far well, as uh yeah. why not a kung fu zombie series <laughs> oh you know see what i what i want to see actually is um i want to see a continuing series of movies uh so ron van cleef who was sort of the big black martial artist who really took off uh, in a way Jim Kelly didn't. Um, his movies just were never huge studio movies. Um, but he, his friend was Charles Bonet who started movies like Death Promise and, and Super Weapons. And um, he was billed as the Puerto Rican Panther and Ron was billed as the Black Dragon. And um, they're together in a movie called, uh, what is it Chris, Bruce it? Lee's Revenge, Black Dragon's Revenge. Right, Death of Bruce um, Lee, yeah. Yeah, where, where Ron Van Cleef plays Ron Van Cleef and he actually walks around in a t-shirt that says Ron Van Cleef. <laughs> and Charles Bonet plays a secret agent with my favorite name ever, Charlie Woodcock. 
And I, and, and these two guys who, um, Ron's still alive, Charles passed away while we were writing the book. We, we got to interview him a few times. He's a great guy. Um, but I really want to see the continuing adventures of the Black Dragon and the Puerto Rican Panther. But also, they have so much chemistry together. I mean, they were friends in real life. And like, they are just so, I could just watch these guys sit around a hotel room and, and shoot the breeze for like hours. And in fact, that's largely a lot of what Black Dragon's Revenge consists of, <laughs> is the two of them just hanging out. So it's lucky for me. Um, <laughs> And then it has a great ending with some woman throwing poison snakes at everyone and Ron Van Cleef calls someone a jive turkey. So it delivers on all levels that I'm looking for. <laughs> but yeah, definitely <laughs> the Black Dragon of the Puerto Rican Panthers continuing adventures. I want that. Okay. Yeah. And and I, I would want a, a a real Remo Williams. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Series. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they tried, they tried to do a TV series, uh, with and it it didn't uh, it didn't catch on obviously and yeah. you know how could it with uh, Roddy McDowell playing Ch yeah. <laughs> and also I just was a uh, brought up uh, the Karate Kid um, and two things the Karate Kid did which I think it doesn't get enough credit for is one is that you know it's essentially a knockoff of Jackie Chan's Yun Wu Ping movies, you know, Drunken Master and Snake and Eagle Shadow with the training sequences with the old master who's, you know, I'm gonna teach you to wash dishes. Oh no, you've learned Kung Fu. And in fact, when Corey Yun, Yun Kwai, who's a Hong Kong director who did his speaking or his Chinese opera school training with Jackie Chan and made movies with Ung Si Yun, the producer, of those movies, he came to America to visit his sister and he saw the Karate Kid in theaters and like went to a payphone and called Ng Si Yun is like, they've ripped off your movies except they suck. Like they've made it suckier with worse action. And so from that, they decided to make their own which became the No Retreat, No Surrender movies. Oh, right. um, yeah. yeah, which I love. And then the other thing is I, and this is sort of head canon, um, but Barry Gordy, the head of Motown, you know, I I like to think that he saw the Karate Kid and was kind of like, wait a minute, how come, and, and saw it as a West Coast movie. Like it's suddenly a movie about martial arts, like with the black experience completely erased. It's California. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a very like, sort of like um, Beach Boys kind of karate. And he's like, the hell with this. I'm making The Last Dragon with, with Vanity and Timac and shooting it in Times Square movie theaters. Well, it's interesting when you were you were going over the history of ninja movies. It, it reminded me the first ninja I ever recall seeing on a big screen was in Revenge of the Pink Panther, which um, predates oh. the Lost Butter book by I think a year, mm -hmm. and it just leave me thinking about the Kato character in in the Pink Panther movies in general, and that was yeah. a very problematic character. I, is he covered at all in the book, or did you not? Yes. Okay, I, I guess I haven't gotten to that part. Yeah, well, actually, that's really early on because so it's interesting. So this is something that really yanks my crank. Um, so uh, you always yank my crank, Mike. Um, but, <laughs> you know, the first time you see an Asian person doing martial arts in an American movie is in the uh, screwball comedy, The Awful Truth, when I think it's um, God, Mickey Morita uh, playing a houseboy, uh, throws Cary Grant in, in a judo throw. And um, and Marita, like, like, that's it. Until Burt Kwok appears in the 60s doing uh, the, the comedy houseboy routine in the Pink Panther movies, that is the only Asian person who does martial arts in an American movie. Everyone else is a white guy in yellow face, except I think there's one exception in the movie, Tokyo Joe, with, um, gosh, what is the actor's name, Chris? Do you remember? Um, um it's uh, uh no i don't, I don't. Um, uh it's sasu it? hayakawa is the silent movie sorry but he's not the one who does the mark oh it's um it's a uh, shimada teru shimada okay yeah he gets to he gets to have some little judo with with uh with bogey um but that's it you know it's like and it's crazy that you look at mickey marita who played something like 12 roles in 1936, the year The Awful Truth came out. It's like houseboy, gardener, houseboy, white trafficker, houseboy, gardener, dinner party guest, waiter. And then you gotta wait all the way to the 60s for Burt Kwok to play a houseboy again. You know, it's just, you, you just look at those years and you're like, ugh. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, and that, but also, though, it's undeniable that Burt Kwok and those scenes in the Pink Panther help to popularize martial arts in movies, you know? Yeah, the um, Kato and Tokyo Joe are covered on page yeah. 15. So there's the, there's the photo. And there were there were a lot more uh, on TV. Yeah, more on TV. Yeah. Uh, there, I, I can't Not remember TV. their names, but there were two Japanese brothers who were in a lot of the TV shows from the late 50s all through the 60s into the 70s. One of them is actually in, I think he plays Master I don't know if he's Master Poe. I forgot the character's name, but in the Kung Fu pilot, he's in he's in that uh, one of the one of the brothers. And I think he's the same one in an early episode of Wanted Dead or Alive. He throws Steve McQueen in a, in a uh, he does a judo throw and he, he throws like Robert Fuller on, on uh, his Western series the same year. Um, they, they were uh, the Asian characters were doing martial arts all over the TV uh, yeah. 60s and not really at all in movies uh, yeah, until the 70s yeah, or well, until Burke Walk and, and yeah. uh, shot in the dark. Yeah. This is the section on this is the beginning of the section on Bruce Bloitation, just to give you an idea of some of the uh, illustrations in the book. Um, you'll ha you even have some photos of uh, the 42nd Street uh, grind houses, the Empire Theater, which had ninjas on the marquee. <laughs> yeah, for... long after it closed. <laughs> yeah, years after it had closed. And uh, this is these are all Sonny Chiba movies. Yeah. So now a, a lot of the images are from your poster collection, Chris. Or... Yeah, uh, like uh, everything on that page there. Yeah, I, I have all those posters. Yep. Now, uh, Chris, I, I can remember, I mean, when you'd go through your poster collection and we could sit there all afternoon and you would just pull out one poster after another. Oh, wait, wait, let me just show you this one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, I got to show you this one. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. And we, we yeah. would put, you know, it's like we'd put the poster of the month. We'd put up like, God forgives, right. I don't. Okay, right. <laughs> let's take it down. Let's put up TNT Jackson. We'll put up TNT yes. Jackson for a month <laughs> or Super Chick. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question or? Yeah. Ah. More questions? Oh, uh, so John, John had a question here. Oh. Uh, one of the things I love about Hong Kong and Taiwan martial arts movies are the, shall we say, creative repurposing of music from Western and Japanese movies. For example, Morricone's score for The Big Gun Down is everywhere. Any favorite examples? Well, I'll do mine because it's easy, which is um, the theme from Shaft which appears everywhere. And actually there's some debate, but either one of the first one or two Bruce Bloitation movies is Queen Boxer starring Judy, Judy uh, Lee, who was billed as Bruce Lee's sister and later had to apologize to the Lee family that <laughs> her American distributor had done that. Um, but every time someone rips out an eyeball in that movie, it, it gets a da 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 um, you get this uh, theme from Shaft riff popping out of nowhere, um, which I love. And yeah, and, and it's also, I think it's in the opening, well, it's definitely in the opening credits for one of the, the Wang Yu movies. I think it's is a oh, Chinese yeah. boxer or one, no, so I think it's one arm boxer. Um, or, but it's just the part, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, it's like yeah. in a loop through the whole opening <laughs> credits. <laughs> did it, did it, did it, did it. Uh, I, I like whatever, uh, and I'm not a big fan of the song so much, but uh, when Time by Pink Floyd shows up in, in uh, oh, yeah. the movies. Oh, yeah. It's, so one, it's in one of the Bruce Lee movies. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I, it's weird because it's, I think it's only on like the Cantonese dialect track that oh. you hear it i think sure. i don't remember but my favorite is actually uh emerson lake and palmer in the opening credits of hepkido oh yeah <laughs> and it's in the trailer too right. yeah. <laughs> uh okay so we got a question from jennifer uh i'm not an aficionado of martial arts movies so i was pretty intrigued to see women popping up in the book as stars of some of these movies can you guys talk a little bit about women and martial arts Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, well, really, uh, in the '60s, they they were the stars of the Hong Kong movies. There were, you know, the the, the Wuxia movies were 
uh, where it was mostly women who were the stars of those movies. And, uh, and then that, that changed with uh, with Wang Yu and, and Lo Li with the, uh, you know with the the one armed swordsman movies, uh, but Polly Shan Kwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I would even say just to qualify what Chris is saying a little, there was almost no male star of the stature of the female stars in Hong Kong cinema before 1967. Uh, you had male stars, but no one like Connie Chan or Josephine Su Fong Fong at all. Like no one even approaching that level of fame. And then, you know, in the early 70s, you had Angela Mao and uh, Grady just mentioned Judy Lee and, and uh, earlier Polly Shan Kwan was in Dragon Inn and, and had, you know, done some uh, films throughout the 70s. Uh, and, and not only uh, martial art stars, but uh, in, in the United States, a, a lot of the women uh, who were fans of the movies uh, like created fanzines and worked for, for magazines, edited magazines, and um, you know, uh, wrote screenplays. Uh, one one of the screenwriters, Neva Frieden, was a distributor. She distributed like yeah. two hundred uh, martial arts movies in the eighties. Yeah. So it de definitely it wasn't uh, it wasn't so much a men's club. Yeah, and also just to throw in for a second, um, you know. Angela Mao was Bruce Lee's sort of studio mate at Golden Harvest and, and was, I mean, I would say before Enter the Dragon, pretty close to as famous as Bruce Lee for audiences. Mm -hmm. I and then Enter the Dragon, it was a Warner Brothers production. You can't compete with that. But and, and I highly encourage anyone. I mean, I love the tournament, Angela Mao's movie, but uh, Broken Oath. Um, you know, definitely watch something by her because she's got so much charisma. She's so great. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Chang Pei Pei was doing a lot of wuxia movies. Uh, there were there were female stars everywhere. And, you know, even in the VHS boom later on, and even in cinema, uh, Cynthia Rothrock, a nice, nice girl from Delaware, uh, doing a lot of stuff. Yes, Madam, one of her finest hours. Uh, and she became a huge star in Hong Kong because there became this I think Hong Kong is a is is a lot more cosmopolitan than the states in a lot of ways, and one of them was that they were all never shy about importing talent. I mean, in the fifties and sixties, they imported Japanese cinematographers to shoot Shaw Brothers movies. Um, they, you know, Five Fingers of Death is the first martial arts movie to break big in the West. It's directed by it's a Shaw Brothers. It's directed by a Korean. Um, and they often imported Western actors to be in their movies. Cynthia Rothrock's one of them, uh, among among many others. I just want to uh, th throw in one one other thing about Angela Mao. Uh, a good movie to see with her because it kind of goes full circle, uh, going back to June Ri, uh, when Taekwondo Strikes, which yeah. also I mean came about because of Bruce Lee. He recommended to uh, Raymond Chow, yeah, you, know, you you should put this friend of mine June Ri in a movie and uh, do, do a movie about Taekwondo because Lee and, and uh, June Ri were friends going back to the um, to the Kung Fu tournament uh, that Ed Parker did the Long Beach tournaments yeah yeah, yeah Angela Mao is one of my favorite uh, martial arts stars and uh, you know as Grady said she had or has so much charisma I mean Chris and I got to meet her that was that was a blast um but one of the things that I really love about her movies is uh, she does uh, different martial arts and, you know, she has different styles in the movies. So in one movie, she's doing Taekwondo. In one movie, it's Hapkido. In the tournament, she's doing Thai kickboxing. Uh, you get a wide variety of things. That, I mean, it's all stuff that she learned for the movies. Uh, so and it's it's just really impressive. So much power and uh, just, you know, just a great presence on screen. Um we have, let's see, another question. Joe, on the ninja topic, what are your thoughts on the mid 80s uh, IFD Godfrey Ho cut and paste ninja films, many starring Richard Harrison and featuring such iconic imagery as roller skating ninja and Garfield phones? <laughs> Although we'll never know how many star Richard Harrison because I think he only shot two and they just <laughs> used that footage in like a dozen. Uh, yeah. That was there are so many of them, it's intimidating. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down. 
Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we write about IFD and Godfrey Ho in the book and, and um, you know, there's so much debate about those guys and, and even between them and there were fires and dad, I mean, it, it's a crazy story. Um, the movies are fun for me for about 20 minutes and then I get a little tired of them, but they are wild. Um, um, okay, I think this will be the last question for the evening. Uh, Ian asks, what's the best obscure martial arts movie we can see on Amazon or Netflix? Um, man, hmm. Chris, do you want to? I, yeah, I don't know what Netflix has. Um, Amazon had, I think they still have a lot of Shaw Brothers movies and um, they, you you can you can do a pretty good deep dive with those i mean they they're they, they definitely have uh, a wide selection of them i mean there are some that uh you know that i would recommend that i don't think they have like to kill a mastermind but they they have a, a lot of them i was watching them uh, a couple of years ago um c- catching up on ones that i hadn't seen in a while or i'd never seen uh so i yeah i i look on amazon for those uh but be, you know beyond that I, I don't know really what uh what's on amazon or netflix yeah i would say just kind of like knowing a little bit about what's on there um it man one and two even though they're newer movies if they're on netflix i think and they're phenomenal and ridiculous and there's a ton of old school faces in there from the 80s um but also uh I think one of the things that, um, two things I'm gonna recommend, one from the 80s and one from the 2000s. And I think they're, I think they're on Amazon Prime um, or, or Netflix. So Jet Li was a nobody from mainland China and he made a couple of Shaolin Temple movies in the 80s that became big and then kind of went away. And he sort of was in the wilderness before he became famous again with the Once Upon a Time in China movie, but um, I believe they're on Amazon. Uh, Shaolin Temple's the first one, and Martial Arts of Shaolin's the third one. Shaolin Kids or Kids from Shaolin's the second one, which is the best, but I'm not sure it's on there. Um, But they're wild, and they are amazing. It's talent from the mainland. You don't see it in a lot of places, in a lot of other movies, and the stuff these guys can do is bonkers. Um, But then, just to give a little shout out to sort of the, the Black Asian martial arts nexus, um, a lot of people really looked down on the movies that came out of the, di- the direct-to-video boom in the 2000s, but I think a ton of these are on Netflix or, um, or uh, uh, Amazon Prime, especially Netflix, I think, but, you know, and these are throwbacks to the old school where it's Israeli directors like Canon, practically, uh, making movies starring Black and Asian martial artists. Um, I would say Undisputed 2 with Michael Jai White's great, Blood and Bone with Michael Jai White. I think they're both Isaac Florentine movies. They're so much fun and they're ridiculous. And um, they really are throwbacks to the old school. And what's interesting to me is these guys don't have the time or the budgets to really do these intricately choreographed fight scenes, but they still get these really great results. And I was interviewing them talking about this. And they, they cast people they know in these movies so that they can improvise parts of their fight scenes together so that they can get the moves but not have to spend a lot of time rehearsing. And then they pre everything on their iPhones. Like, you know, will this shot look good? Okay, let's do this bit here. We'll just come up with it. So it's a wild seat of your pants kind of throwback filmmaking as well. Yeah, we had two comments, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, John wrote, YouTube is the way to go for Kung Fu movies. Not always the best quality, but hundreds of them. Yeah. And um, let's see. Tammy wrote, Arrow also has a streaming service just for those yeah. who may not know. Right. Uh, yeah, because a- Arrow's doing the and 88 films also. They're doing a lot of Shaw Brothers movies now, um, either in the sets or standalone titles. Uh, but you can you can dive a little deeper on Amazon uh, and find things that are not coming out, uh, things that that aren't so much uh, covered. Because with the Shaw Brothers, a lot of times you see the same titles re-released and uh, they put out so many movies, they produce so many films that 
uh, there are so many good ones that you you really have to kind of go to the you know the celestial discs or the gray market to to see because they're they're not really gonna ever come out here legitimately i don't think like to kill a mastermind or mob fix patrol or uh some you know many there there are tons of them phil can i make a quick comment yes dad <laughs> <laughs> well actually two quick comments okay. the audio is wonderful you do a great job grady and that's i heard oh, it three months before i ever saw the book <laughs> uh, but the, the the other comment is the Mr. Moto films um, do uh, incorporate a fair amount of judo. But what's interesting is that one of the you probably know that one of the Mr. Moto films was supposed to be a Charlie Chan, Mr. Moto's Gamble, and uh, uh, Warner Oland went off to Sweden and died. And uh, they incorporated K. Luke, who played number one son, and of course was in the Kung Fu TV show, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, there's actually a scene where Mr. Moto's, well, where Peter Laurie's stunt double flips somebody, does a judo throw in it, and K. Luke is in the scene taking this course uh, on criminology from Mr. Moto. So I just thought right. I'd throw that in. That's 1938. Yeah. Did that get cut out of the book or? <laughs> we got some Mr. Moto in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that was, yeah. Because you know, in the TV section, uh, we talked about Longstreet, which was based on a series of books uh, about a, a blind insurance detective. And uh, in one of those movies, because there, there had been a movie uh, made based on one of those books, there's a judo scene in that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we talked about the the books and the Mr. Moto, uh, Mr. Moto was in there in that section. Also the eighty seventh precinct and and the James Bond books and yeah the, that was I think that was in the section on either books or or uh, or TV. I, I and I remember. wonder who did the uh, who actually did the stunt the stunts for Laurie. Yeah, I have yeah. no idea. No, nah, I, I don't know either. Hmm. Okay. Thank well, you. Yep. Yep. Actually, actually, it was probably Harvey Perry, um, who did, he was Peter Laurie's stunt double and he knew judo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you again so much for uh, doing this program. Uh, it's, it's been great. Um, you know, I, I, Thank you to all the Zoom attendees uh, and, you know, not only for attending, but asking great questions. Uh, and this is this has been a very entertaining, very educational evening. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. And yep, thank, um, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right. So good night, everyone. Take care. Have a good night, night y'all. Everyone. Um,